There you go. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wake Up With Wildlife uh, lecture series. We are so excited to have you all with us today. Um, I'm joined with one of our wonderful Project Wildlife volunteers, Cindy Myers. Um, just a little quick little housekeeping tip. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we will get to those um, during Cindy's presentation. We are going to meet a few of our bat ambassadors at the end of the program, so stay tuned all the way to the end. Um, next month is going to be raptors and so we will be able to meet um, a few of our raptor ambassadors, our red shoulder hawk, our merlin falcon, and our barn owl. So tune in to that month as well. And then December is finally up on the website as well. And December is going to be our wildlife veterinarian, Dr. John Inyart. And he is going to be talking about some of the case studies that we have seen this past year, um, as well as providing some really humane tips and better way, best ways to coexist with our local wildlife. And so again, if you have any questions, just go ahead and put them in that Q&A box. And then I'm going to let our wonderful volunteer who has 18 plus years of doing bat rehabilitation and education. Um, and so she's our bat specialist. And I'm going to let Cindy take it away. Thank you, Carly. All right, let me uh, share my screen. Hold on just a sec. There we go. Okay. So uh, as Carly said, I'm I'm on the bat team, and uh, that's so. Don't ask me any bird questions because uh, I just want to talk about bats. I think bats are really underappreciated uh, for their role in in our uh, ecosystems around the world. So let me get started here. Introduction to bats. Uh, some of you may already know some of this stuff, but uh, this is a family program, so, uh, so if kids want to watch it later. So the order of bats is called Chiroptera. They're so unique in the mammalian world that they have their own order. Bats are not rodents. Um, they're actually more closely related to the order of primates than they are to the order of rodentia. And the Latin word for the order of bats is Chiroptera, which means hand wing in Latin. Bats have exactly the same bone structure in their hands and arms that humans do. All bats have a thumb and four fingers, it's just that they have really long finger bones and arm bones, and then they have that, their flap of skin extends all the way to the tips of their fingers. So bats fly with their hands. Now bats are the only mammals that are capable of powered flight. They're uh, what they call flying squirrels and sugar gliders, but they can't really fly. They're just gliders. They wish they were bats, but they're not. Uh, they can glide and eventually they will fall to the ground, whereas bats can propel themselves through the air for hours on end. The order of bats, Chiroptera, is divided into two big suborders. A lot of people are more familiar with the mega Chiroptera or the flying foxes or the big fruit bats that are found in the old world tropics. Uh, a lot of those bats are the ones that you see in the uh, Batman movies and the vampire movies because most of the world's bats are what they call micro bats. And those bats are pretty small. They're about the size of your ear when their long finger bones are folded up. So nobody's gonna be, a, you know, in a haunt, movie about a haunted house, nobody's gonna be afraid of a two inch fur ball flying around through your haunted house. So they always use these flying foxes or the mega bats uh, in the horror movies. Now the micro bats like we have here in the Americas, they see in black and white, Whereas the mega bats, the big flying foxes, they can see in color and their vision is about as good as human vision because that's how they find their food, using their vision and their sense of smell. Now worldwide, there are about 5,400 species of mammals and almost a quarter of those species are bats. There are more than 1,400 bat species. I think there was 1,411 at last count because they're identifying new species every year. About 70% of the world's bat species eat insects. Uh, they'll eat bugs, they eat mosquitoes, they eat moss, they eat beetles, they eat all kinds of crop pests all around the world. And there's even a species here in uh, Southern California and the Southwest of the US that eats scorpions for a living. Worldwide, there's about 260 species of fruit bats. 
Now, we don't have any fruit bats native to California. There's only one species of fruit bat found in the United States, and it's called the Jamaican fruit bat, and they live down in the Florida Keys, but they're, they're not very common down there even. So we don't have any fruit bats native to California. If you want to see fruit bats, you have to go to a zoo somewhere. Worldwide, there are 50 species of nectar feeding bats. So when the hummingbirds and the bumblebees and the uh, butterflies go to sleep at dusk, then the nectar feeding bats come out and they will go from flower to flower, pollinating and getting sip of nectar. In the US, we have three species of nectar feeding bats and they're all found in the southwestern desert. And one of those species, the Mexican long tongue bat, is found here in San Diego on a pretty regular basis. It's detected by the biologists doing field surveys. Worldwide, there are nine meat-eating bat species. Now, that doesn't mean that they, you know, eat hamburgers or, or steaks or anything like that. They will catch uh, small, smaller bat species. They'll eat uh, frogs. They'll eat lizards, small snakes. Um, let's see, they'll catch uh, small birds, rodents, but we don't have any real meat-eating bats in the U.S. Worldwide, there are five species of fishing bats. If you've ever seen a video of an osprey or an eagle flying over a body of water or an inlet and snagging a big fish with its long talons, well, these fishing bats will do the same thing. They'll fly across the surface of a pond or a lake, and they'll snag little minnow-sized fish with their long uh, toenails. Now, I guess I have to talk about this. Worldwide, out of all these 1,400 plus bat species, there are only three of them that eat blood for a living. And they are the vampire bats, of course. Now, we do not have any vampire bats native to the United States. They, uh, the common vampire is the only one of those that even eats mammal blood. The other two prefer bird blood. And uh, the common vampire is only found in Southern Mexico, Central America, and South America. They are not native to the United States. And those vampire bats, they'll take a, about a tablespoon of, uh, of blood from the animal that they're feeding off, and then they fly away. And usually the animal will sleep through the whole thing. But those bats don't live here. Now, in San Diego County, we are lucky enough, we have almost half the U.S. bat species have been documented right here in the county. We are lucky enough to have the smallest U.S. bat species. They're called the canyon bat, and they top out at about a seventh of an ounce, which is they weigh about as much as a Hershey's Kiss. And they're one of the first bats to wake up right at dusk. So almost as soon as the sun goes down, if you live along an inland canyon somewhere, and you see a little a tiny bat flitting around with maybe a six or seven inch wingspan, uh, chasing after little gnats and midges, it's probably a canyon bat. And gram for gram, those bats have a lot of batitude. Uh, they, they're very feisty little bats in care. It's almost like a chihuahua that thinks it's a great Dane. And then we are also lucky enough that we have the largest U.S. bat species found here. It's called the Western Mastiff bat. And uh, these bats are really cool. I hear them up near where I live, sometimes late at night. They echolocate at a frequency that's low enough for humans to hear. They're pretty rare. We've only gotten, I think I've only met one or two of them in my 18 plus years as a volunteer rehabber. They're very cool bats. Uh, let's see. Oh, and in San Diego County, I was going to tell you, all of our bats eat uh, bugs for a living, except for that one rare nectar-feeding bat species. So uh, our bats will eat uh, beetles and midges and gnats and mosquitoes and uh, scorpions, katydids, locusts, cockroaches, all kinds of pesky insects. So uh, 22 or 21 of our 22 bat species are insectivorous bats. Now, bats have been around for a very long time. The, the fossil record of bats is pretty spotty because bats are very tiny. And so once they die, they tend to be scavenged pretty quickly by whatever predator is walking around on the ground. Uh, but the, the, earliest, the earliest complete bat fossils, this is a reproduction of a 45 million year old fossil that was found in a shale formation in Wyoming. And you can, scientists have studied these fossils and, and the bats are pretty much in their present form already. You can see the long finger bones and uh, they believe that they were already echolocating at that time 45 million years ago. 
So bats have been around for a very long time. Now the five bats of happiness is a common symbol in, a, in Chinese society, bats are considered symbols of good luck. And uh, they, there's this symbol called the wufu, and it's the five bats of happiness. Uh, and there's even a coin that shows, that shows the five bats of happiness. And what that represents is uh, health, wealth, love of virtue, a long life, and a peaceful death at, at the end of your long life. And so bats are considered really good luck in China. And you'll see a lot of the, the wufu symbol, the five bats of happiness uh, logo in a lot of Chinese architecture, uh, textiles, uh, ceramics, that sort of thing. I wish we considered bats lucky here. So where do bats live? Most of the bat species in San Diego County are small and they're shy. And so they tend to hide in the daytime because bats are pretty easily snagged by predators like hawks, um, even scrub jays, ravens, crows, any of those big flying birds will snag bats and eat them if they see them out in the daytime. So most of our bats try and hide in the daytime. And like this bat on the, on the left of the screen here, you see him trying to climb up under this little shutter. And uh, so they'll hide in bat houses, they hide in rocky crevices. Um, but in San Diego County, we are lucky enough to have three species of what they call the tree roosting bats, the lazaring bats. And they will roost, they're solitary bats, and they roost out in the leaves of trees in the open. And their fur color uh, looks like a drying tree leaf, and it helps give them some protective camouflage from any birds that might be hunting for them in the treetops. Now, this is a picture of a hoary bat here. This is a photo of a boulder out in Ramona somewhere, I believe. And in this rocky crevice of in this boulder is a colony of that largest bat species in the United States, the Western Mastiff bats. And those bats, because they have about a two foot wingspan and they, they need a lot of drop space to gain velocity and fly away. So they tend to roost high in boulders or up on cliff faces so that they can drop down when they're taking flight and, and gain velocity and get airborne. Now, a lot of people know that bats like to live in caves and we don't have a lot of caves in San Diego County, but we do have some abandoned mines and we also have some storm drains. So uh, bats will, because like the inside of a storm drain, it's concrete and it feels like the surface of a cave. And so as long as it keeps the bats safe from predators like these scary humans, the bats will sometimes roost up in the top of the storm drains or in old mines, places like that. And some bats also like to live on wood, like these pallid bats. They prefer to roost in wood when possible. Uh, so these guys are probably living in an old barn or attic where this photo was taken. This is a photo of the Congress Avenue Bridge in downtown Austin, Texas. And it's a beautiful spot there. There's running trails along both sides of the bridge here. And beneath that bridge uh, are these expansion joints so that the concrete can flex in the heat and the frost. And inside those expansion joints, apparently they're just the right width and depth. Uh, so the whole bridge serves as a giant bat house. And inside that bridge live a colony of about a million and a half Mexican feet-tailed bats. And it's a huge tourist attraction in Austin. People will line up, as you can see, along the top of the bridge and in this park down below the bridge to watch the bats emerge at dusk. And there's restaurants and you can take little riverboat cruises out to watch the bats fly out from under the bridge every night. When they first moved, uh, retrofitted this bridge and the bats started to move under the, under the bridge, the people in Austin were freaking out. Oh my gosh, all these bats, what are we gonna do? This is terrible. And they just educated people, you know, bats are beneficial. They're not gonna hurt you. If you find one on the ground, just never touch it with your bare hands. And now those bats in the bridge bring in about $12 million a year in tourism revenue for the city of Austin. Now this is National Geographic video of a area in central Texas where there's some caves and inside those caves, when they turned on this weather radar, they couldn't figure out what this weird storm was that was popping up at dusk. And then the same thing happened the next night and the next night. And they realized that it's a colony of bats. It's several colonies of bats coming out of these caves in central Texas. And 
they're so big that they show up on the weather radar. They have to divert flights around them when they come out. And inside this one cave lives the largest group of mammals anywhere on the planet. Uh, it's called Bracken Cave, and the cave is, and several hundreds of acres around the cave have been purchased to protect the area by Bat Conservation International. And it's the largest group of wild mammals anywhere on Earth. And it takes the colony three to five hours from, to emerge from Bracken Cave every night at dusk. And it goes on so long that the bats are still streaming out of the cave long after the sun goes down and you can't even see them coming out anymore. But there's 20 to 30 million bats that live in this one cave. And it's a colony of nursing moms. And at first the biologists couldn't figure out what, what all these bats could be feeding on because these nursing mother bats, they have to produce a lot of milk for their big pups after they give birth. And the biologists uh, finally put these uh, weather balloons and, and insect gathering balloons up high up in the atmosphere. And they found that the bats are, are intercepting flocks of migrating moths up at 10,000 feet up in the air. The bats can fly 100 miles an hour and go 10,000 feet up to chase these giant flocks of migratory moths. And the bats are estimated to eat up to 200 tons of insects every summer night. 200 tons of corn earworm moths and army cutworm moths and other crop pests that would be hatching out and migrating up through the US corn belt. So those bats are really important. It's estimated that bats contribute up to $50 billion a year to US agriculture in reduced pesticide use by, that farmers don't need because the bats are eating so many of their crop pests and increased yield when they harvest. So how do bats see at night? I've been doing this for a long time and I've never met a bat that had to wear glasses. So uh, obviously this wouldn't work for these little guys. So bats can navigate and find their way around and orient themselves using sound. Bats will uh, echolocate. They are sending out high frequency sound waves through their mouth or through their nose when they're flying around in the dark. And they, uh, those sound waves will bounce off the beetle or whatever insect it is that they're chasing. And then the waves bounce back to their ears and the bats are able to, to hone in on where their prey is and then they're able to find it and catch it and eat it in complete darkness. And that is called echolocation. They are locating their prey and their surroundings using the echoes from their, from their call. Now here's a few photos of bats feeding. This is obviously a pollen or nectar feeding bat. And you can see uh, that uh, he's got relatively large eyes and his ears aren't too big because he doesn't have to chase his food. His food can't fly away from him. Here's another nectar uh, and pollen feeding bat. He's got a long muzzle and big eyes because he's finding his food using his sense of smell and his sense of vision. And he's also got those relatively small ears because he doesn't have to chase his food. Bananas can't fly. And this is one of our local species. This is a pallid bat. And this guy, it, it's a cool photo because it shows all the different finger bones. So this right here is the bat's thumb. This is the bat's index finger. This long bone that forms the tip of the finger is the bat's middle finger. Here's the ring finger. And this one down here is the pinky finger. And you can see his elbows and he's got a katydid here and that's the katydid's antenna that you're seeing. So this is the pallid bat. This is one of the few bat species here that hunts their food almost exclusively off the ground. And the cool thing about pallid bats is most pallid bats love to eat scorpions and they are totally immune to scorpion venom. So they'll fly down, you know, tackle a scorpion and fly away and, and eat it. And as the scorpion tries to sting them, it doesn't even slow the pallid bat down. They'll just eat the whole thing, except they do litter. Uh, pallid bats don't like to eat scorpion claws. So they'll drop the little scorpion claws in a pile on the ground under their roost. So if you ever find a little pile of scorpion claws on your patio in the morning, you have pallid bats uh, using your place as a rest stop. This is a, a photo of a fruit bat from Africa. You can see he's, he's eating a piece of really ripe fruit. 
batch will generally eat fruit that is so ripe that it's too ripe to be harvested and sent to market because that's, you know, it's, um, it's sweeter and softer for them. And so this guy is going to have a very sticky tummy afterward, no doubt. So bats are uh, important pollinators for a lot of uh, plants in the desert and in the rainforest. It's called Chiropterophily. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And it's called bat-loving flowers or uh, bat flowers. And there's a lot of flowers that are dependent on bats for pollination. So as you can see, this bat is hovering at this flower. He's got a very long tongue, like our local Mexican long tongue bat has a very long tongue. And uh, they'll, they'll reach their tongue deep into the, the flower. And then as they get a sip of nectar, they're getting the, their head or their back dusted with pollen from the flower. And then they visit the next flower and that's how they're cross-pollinating plants. So there's a lot of important plants that are dependent on bats for pollination. The, uh, the big columnar cacti that you see, the photos of the Cardone and Saguaro cacti, uh, those are, and dragon fruit, a lot of those columnar cacti are dependent on bats for pollination. So bats are really important gardeners, actually. Now our Mexican long tongue bat is named the long tongue bat because its tongue is a third its body length. Here's a few of the plants and uh, food crops, human food crops that are dependent on bats for pollination or seed dispersal. So uh, avocados are originally bat pollinated and the seeds are dispersed by bats originally. Bananas are bat pollinated originally. Uh, durian, peaches, figs. There's uh, lots of important food crops that are dependent on bats for, for pollination or for seed dispersal because bats are even more efficient seed dispersers than birds are. Usually if a bird is eating a piece of fruit or something like that, they'll just roost and then the, the seeds will just fall in a little pile beneath wherever they're roosting. Whereas bats will take a piece of ripe fruit or a fig or something and they'll eat it as they're flying and, they're, and they disperse poop. So every time the seed falls, it's basically falling in a little pile of guano or fertilizer. So bats are really important uh, to help regrow clear-cut tropical rainforest. They, they help basically plant a lot of those pioneer plants. So here's that vampire bat. I have to talk about them, I guess, even though it is you know, bat appreciation month in October. Uh, so the vampire bats, they don't, they don't suck blood. What they'll do is they'll sneak up on a sleeping deer in the rainforest of South America or on a sleeping taper or a bird and they'll, they'll sneak up to it and they'll make a little nick with their two sharp teeth and then they'll, they'll lap up about a tablespoon of blood and then they'll fly away. And they, uh, the common vampire is probably the only bat species in the world that is really increasing in number and doing well because as we clear cut tropical rainforests to bring in cattle ranches, a cattle ranch is like a hometown buffet to a common vampire bat. It's like every cow basically is a, is a buffet bar. So those bats can be increasing in number down there. And one of the problems with, with those increasing numbers is that they can spread rabies in a cattle herd. If the vampire bat is suffering from rabies, it can, it can inject that or you know, spread it through its saliva. So they can pass rabies to, to cattle herds in Latin America, but um, they, uh, uh, a lot of bat, other bat species end up being accidentally killed because the cattle ranchers are trying to uh, wipe out vampire bats down there and, and they aren't always sure what species and sometimes they'll, they'll attack caves or roosts of the wrong species. So a lot of bats are, are being killed because of the vampire bats down there. Here's a few bat facts. One single bat can catch and eat up to a thousand mosquito sized insects per hour. That is why organic farmers like to put bat houses in their orchards or fields to help protect their crop because they eat so many crop pests. They'll eat, you know, cucumber beetles and corn earworm moths and tomato hornworms and codling moths and all kinds of crop pests. Here's another cool bat fact. Bats are the longest living mammal on earth relative to their size. The uh, current bat longevity record belongs to a Brantz myotis in Russia 
who lived for at least 41 years old. He was banded in this long-term banding study that was done in a hibernation site. And every winter they'd go back to this cave and, and see if they saw another banded bat. And uh, so the record would creep up every couple of years, 34 years, 40 years. And then they found a bat who was banded as a young bat at least 41 years prior. And they pulled him off the cave wall and recorded his band number and weighed him and then put him back on the cave wall. So, but most of our bats don't live that long. Most of our bats probably live no more than 20 years in the wild. Now we'll talk a little bit about bat diversity. As I said, almost a quarter of the world's mammal species are bats. So they're very diverse. You just can't generalize anything about bats except that they can all fly. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's so much amazing diversity. Here's that Mexican long-tongued bat. This is our local species. They're fairly common in Southern California, or in San Diego County anyway. I think we're at the northern end of their migratory range. But the biologists, when they do field surveys with their bat detectors or acoustic equipment, they do uh, detect the acoustic calls of these bats. And they feed and pollinate the Shaw's agave they, um, because they're nectar feeding bats because of that long tongue. And this one has like a little nose leaf, which means that uh, if you find, see a bat with a nose leaf, that means they, they emit their echolocation signal out of their nose. And this helps channel their echolocation signal. And you can see he's got a long muzzle to reach deep into those agave flowers, like the tequila agave is bat pollinated by this species of bat. So uh, these bats are super important. If you're ever sitting around having a margarita on Cinco de Mayo, you should thank this bat. Here's a Western yellow bat. These bats are beautiful bats. And you can see the yellowish color of his fur looks just like the color of this dried palm frond. These bats live almost exclusively beneath those dried frond skirts that form around the tops of the tall California fan palms and the uh, Mexican fan palms. Those dried frond skirts are natural bat houses for about a dozen of our local bat species as they, they hide under there and they'll give birth in the summertime. And they also use them as hibernation sites in the wintertime. Now here's that Western Mastiff bat. This, this bat was rescued from Ramona and released about 19 years ago. I just missed meeting her. And this is the one that has the two foot wingspan. And uh, this poor girl, you can see she's got a mustache and really hairy arms. And this is a free tailed bat species. Real quick, Cindy, one of our questions that came in was, um, how large are the Western Mastiff bats? You said they have a two foot wingspan. Do you have an approximate weight on them? Maybe 50 grams. I would have to look that up just to confirm, but uh, as I said, I haven't seen one in about, gosh, eight years. They're, they're not very rare. I mean, they're pretty rare in care. So probably 50 grams. Great, thank you. Now this photo is, is not a native species. This is a species found in the Caribbean, but it's really a beautiful photo. And I just wanted to show you some of the features that we use to identify bats when they come into care or that the field biologists use to help them identify bats. So this bat, as you can see, has a nose leaf, which means that it emits its echolocation signals out of its nose. And it also has this little notch in its short kind of blunt tragus. This uh, little flap inside its ear is called a tragus. And we humans have a tragus too. It's this little thing right there. And some people will get their tragus pierced. But uh, different bat species have different shaped traguses, tragi. Uh, so this one you get is a pretty distinctive little tragus shape on this species. Our, our myotis tend to have, uh, whoops, hold on. Uh, the myota species that we have locally, we have probably 10 different myota species here and they have a long pointy tragus and the canyon bats have kind of a short blunt tragus. So these are just cool features to look for when you're trying to identify a bat in care. Now this is a photo of an, an eastern red bat. These are beautiful little bats. You can see this one has a short blunt curved tragus. And this is a solitary species. They roost out in the leaves of trees. Our local Western red bats seem to prefer cottonwood trees, but we've also gotten them rescued after being trimmed out of pepper trees or that kind of thing. Uh, 
They're beautiful little bats. The cool thing about red bats is that they're one of the few bat species where you can tell the gender of the bat without having to flip it over and look underneath. Uh, the male red bats tend to have brighter orange fur, whereas the female red bats tend to have uh, not quite as bright orange fur and little frosty highlights on their, on their fur. They're gorgeous little bats. They look like little orangutans with wings. Now this is another of our local tree roosting species in San Diego County. This was a pair of hoary bats that were born to a bat uh, in care years ago. She came in uh, at Christmas time. She, we think she may have been hibernating in a Christmas tree that was cut down. And the people found this uh, injured bat in their driveway when they were unloading the Christmas tree. And then about five months later, the bat, that female bat, she had a badly broken arm, so she was still in care and she gave birth to a set of twins. Now, most mother bats only give birth to one pup per year. Bats are the slowest reproducing mammal on earth relative to their size. Uh, as I said, they have a really slow reproductive rate relative to their size. Most mammals, if you're, if the smaller the mammal, the faster the reproductive rate, but bats have not read any of that scientific literature because they lead relatively long lives for such tiny mammals and they have a very slow reproductive rate. But anyway, so this mom gave birth to a set of twins and you can see they're roosting, they're hanging tummy to tummy. And this photo is shot from down below and they're kind of sleepy. Here's a little sleepy eye and you can see here's the nose and his chin. And here's a, another sleepy eye and her nose and chin over here. And they're just barely awake. This is a super rare bat species. Uh, as I said, I've been doing this for 18 and a half years, and this bat came into care in December, six months before I started volunteering as a bat rehabilitator. So I just missed her. She came into care. She was found grounded in Escondido, and the finder used gloves to safely uh, rescue her so that there was no bite or contact or scratches. And uh, she's a spotted bat, and they're gorgeous bats. They have jet black fur with three big white spots on their back. And as you can see, they have these beautiful pale pink ears. And when they spread their wings, they're also pale pink, almost see-through wings. They're just gorgeous bats. She had a, a wrist injury and uh, was on antibiotics and in care for about six weeks and then was released back to the wild in Escondido. So maybe she's still out there. This is not a local bat species, but it's a cool photo. So I, I include the slide anyway. I think they're found in uh, Arizona or other parts of the US desert Southwest. This right here is the bat's ear. And here's the bat's eye set in the middle of its ear. And this down here is its mouth. And this little squiggly area is its nose. So that's a strange looking bat. This, is, uh, this photo was taken down in Costa Rica, I believe, or, or Belize. And it's a photo of a, of a heliconia leaf, like a long banana leaf style like that. And uh, under there are, is a little family of tent making bats. These bats will roost uh, beneath these certain leaves in the rainforest. And there's about 15 different species of tent making bats found in the world. And this particular species, they'll find a leaf style that they like, and they chew along the spine of the leaf just enough so that it collapses to form a little pup tent. And then they'll roost under there. And these bats have an interesting social structure. They'll stay together with one male and a few females. So he's got like a little harem of females and then the pups from those females. And then when the leaf eventually dies, then they'll move on to the next leaf. And they're tiny little things. Apparently they're, they're very timid bats from what I've read. I've never been to Central America, so I've never got to see one yet, but they, they're not much bigger than a cotton ball and they have pale yellow ears and a little pale yellow nose leaf. And they're just beautiful little things. Now, some of you must have read Stella Luna over the years. Uh, this always reminds me of, of the mother and pup from Stella Luna, that children's book. And you can see that these are fruit bats. This is a photo of, uh, I believe it's Gambian epauletted bats from Africa. And you can see they have the big eyes of a fruit bat and the long dog-like muzzle of a flying fox or a fruit bat and the relatively small ears because 
fruit can't fly. But you can see how big that pup is. Can you imagine trying to carry that thing around through the air? Oh my gosh, these poor moms. This is a photo of a Yuma myotis. This uh, is one of our most common bat species in San Diego County. It's one of the ones that's most often reported when the bat biologists are out doing field surveys here in the county. And it's one of the ones that comes into care most often uh, through, through our records over the years with uh, Project Wildlife San Diego Humane Society. So they're, they're maybe top out at around six or seven grams. So they're, they're tiny little bats and they're very fluffy and they're very fussy. It's almost like a hummingbird with fur. They're just always yelling and swearing and chattering. And they're just very animated little bats. And it's also, the cool thing about Yuma's is that it's one of the bats that also first wakes up right at dusk and they hunt almost exclusively over water. So if you're ever near a pond or a lake or a, one of our coastal lagoons at dusk and you see little bats flitting low across the water, snagging emerging aquatic insects like mosquitoes, it's probably a Yuma out catching his or her breakfast. Now this bat came in with a band on it and a lot of researchers uh, are uh, recommending against using bands on bats anymore because there have been a lot of banding injuries. The, eventually, some of these bands can wear through the, the skin membrane on the bat's forearm, and they can cause infections and bone injuries and, and things like that. So uh, this bat, when it came into care, the band number was recorded, and the researchers were notified of, of, the, of the record of the bat, and then the band was removed before the bat was released back to the wild. This is another one of our most common species here in San Diego County. This is the same species that lives in Bracken Cave in Texas with that colony of 20 million Mexican petals. So they're very gregarious little bats. They tend to be pretty timid and docile when they come into care. Uh, they're, you know, they're just kind of shy and uh, retiring little bats. But uh, they, it's a free-tailed bat species and so they, um, have a, a tail that sticks out past their tail membrane. It looks almost like a mouse tail. And we have four different free-tailed bat species in, in that family, the Molossidae family here in San Diego County. And you can see that this bat has kind of short velvety fur. So they, they can't hibernate. They will tend to migrate. Uh, so if they're living in a cooler climate, they will tend to migrate maybe down to the coastal foothills in the winter time or they'll migrate to a slightly warmer winter roost. Here in Southern California, our bats are pretty spoiled. They don't really have to migrate very far. So uh, we're, you know, especially in San Diego County, our bats are really lucky. But you can see these, uh, this cool, uh, another cool thing about the Mexican retail bats is that they have these little sensitive, almost like whiskers on their toes. They also have shorter fur on their toes that is almost like little bristle brushes that they helps them groom their fur with their toes but they've got these cool, long, sensitive, uh, almost whiskers on their toes that helps them feel their way around when they're backing up into a dark cave or into a bat house. This is a photo of a big brown bat, another one of our more common bat species in San Diego County. The big brown bats tend to be beetle specialists. Now, all of our insect eating bats are opportunistic feeder. So like if a Mexican fetal can't find enough of his favorite moths, he will also chase after beetles or, you know, other flying insects at night. But the Mexican fetals tend to be moth specialists. The Yumas tend to be uh, aquatic insect specialists or emerging aquatic insect specialists or like mosquitoes. And the big browns, they just love beetles. So, you know, most bats, because they have really, uh, they eat insects for a living and insects are crunchy. So I would assume actually, uh, but because they have, they eat these crunchy insects for a living, they have to bite through the exoskeleton. So bats have really sharp teeth. So rule number one, never pick up a bat with your bare hands because their teeth are like little needles. And uh, if a scared bat is on the ground, it will be happy to show you its teeth and you know, let you know what it's gonna do if you try and touch it with bare hands. So the big brown bats, uh, they're, they're beetle specialists and they've got this long, beautiful fur. They're just gorgeous bats. And uh, they are interesting because they're one of our hibernators. They are true hibernators. They can go to sleep for weeks at a time in the wintertime, depending on the weather. And 
they can lower their heart rate to 10 beats per minute when they're in a deep state of hibernation in the coldest cave in the darkest part of winter. And they can raise their heart rate to over a thousand beats per minute when they're flying around chasing insects. And they can lower their respiration rate to about one breath every hour or two if, it, if the conditions are right during hibernation. So they are true hibernators. They're hardy little bats and they're just gorgeous. Now here's that pallid bat. These are the guys that, that hunt their prey off the ground. So they're gonna be looking for arthropods like centipedes, scorpions, uh, katydids, cicadas, things like that that are on the ground. And there's also records, uh, there's a couple of uh, anecdotal reports of these bats. One was seen flying over Palomar Mountain carrying a small rodent. And I personally have talked to someone who had pallid bats night roosting outside her back porch. And uh, she found the reins of a tiny lizard along with like some insect wings and other parts like that. So, uh, so apparently our local pallid bats do take small lizards sometimes. So they're, they're opportunistic, but basically they're gonna be hunting their prey off the ground. And you can see they've got this little, almost like a Cinnabon style little nostrils. They're really cute. This is, I think, one of our most beautiful bat species. This is the Western red bat. And this little female, you can just see the little highlights on her fur. She was found uh, probably half grown I believe last year she was, came in as a patient and uh, she was found clinging to a bush. We don't know if her mother dropped her. The red bats are one, I think that they may be the only species in the world that actually gives birth to a, a litter of pups each year. The red bat moms will give birth each summer to a litter of three to five pups at a time. And so we don't know what happened to this girl. She wasn't, she was, you know, found lost by her mom somehow and uh, she was raised up and then got this photo of her before she was released. You can see she's got kind of a short, curved, blunt tragus, and um, she's showing you her little sharp teeth, and they're just gorgeous bats. They're not that smart uh, compared to some of our other bat species. They're like the Irish setters of the bat world. You know, they're really pretty, but maybe not that bright. Now this is a photo, I believe this is an Australian bat species. It's a photo of a little red flying fox, which is a fruit bat species. And you can pretty much guess that it's a fruit bat. It's got those big ears and, or the big eyes, I mean, and the not too big ears and this long fox-like muzzle. And so he, that's a fruit bat or a nectar feeding bat, I'll have to check. But yeah, it's definitely not an insect eating bat with those big eyes. Here's another fruit bat. This is an African bat species. To me, this looks like a chihuahua. Such a gorgeous bat. Now the epauletted fruit bats, uh, they're called epauletted fruit bats because the males during courtship season, they have these white patches of fur on their shoulders that they'll flash these, they can raise these little patches of fur and show off to try and attract girls. Try and you know, look, look their best for a female, trying to attract a mate. This is an Australian bat species. It's a flying fox. Uh, so a fruit or nectar feeding bat. This is not a local species, but it's just an amazing photo. This is a nose leaf, this big long thing, and then its mouth is way down here, and it's got this giant ear, and then look at the size of the tragus right here. That is the bat's tragus. So that's a cool, and you know that bat is looking for insects. With ears like that, he's chasing something. So I have to admit, I am like the world's biggest bat fan and biggest bat enthusiast. But uh, even I have to admit, that's a homely bat. That is a bat face that only its mother could love. Uh, uh, I couldn't understand why would, it, you know, what purpose does this serve? And a friend of ours that uh, uh, used to volunteer with us years ago, she went on to get her PhD and she worked with these bats down in Central America. And she said that it, these bats eat fruit and so when they, they have a really strong bite and when they bite into a piece of fruit and bury their head in the piece of fruit, all of these uh, channels help to channel the fruit juice down into their mouth. So they look that way for a reason. Don't judge. 
This is an African bat species, and this is not just a rebellious teenager. Uh, this is basically a, a courtship thing. So these males, the Chapin's free tail bat, they also have this, this little tuft that they will raise uh, when they're courting a female, trying to attract a mate. I think it's very attractive. This is a cool photo of a, this is basically the Australian equivalent of our local pallid bat. They, they live in a very similar, uh, more arid environment and they hunt their prey off the ground and they have these big eyes and they also have these big ears and they hunt similar prey as do our pallid bats. So it's kind of a, an Australian equivalent. So those are some of the local bats and bats and found in other parts of the world. So here's a couple more bat facts. Bat pups are born feet first, ouch, so that they can hold onto their mother and not fall to the ground. And when they're born, their baby bats are born with full-size adult feet and full-size adult thumbs so that they can hang onto their mom, you know, and not fall to the floor of the cave or fall out of the tree. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're hanging on for dear life from birth. And at birth, a pup can weigh 25 to 30% of its mother's weight. And most, as I said, most mother bats just have one pup per year. So 25 to 30%, that would be like me giving birth to a preschooler. Feet first with full-size feet. So we have to talk about safety and rabies. Now mammals, all mammals are susceptible to a deadly viral infection called rabies. So uh, we always tell people safety first. If we get a call from a bat or from somebody who's found a bat, the first thing we have to say is, have, how did you, you know, did anybody touch the bat with bare hands? Or did your cat or dog come in contact with the bat? Because um, if there was any contact like that, then the bat needs to be submitted for rabies testing to your local health department. Uh, so safety first, never rescue any bat with your bare hands because health departments take the risk of rabies very seriously. It's a deadly disease. It's almost 100% fatal. So we don't take any chances and, and uh, we always try and teach the public that you know we wanna try and help bats. Uh, about 90% of the bats that are found on the ground don't have rabies. And so we can try and help those, we can try and save those as long as people have taken precautions to protect themselves. So I've, been, I've had my rabies shots, uh, I, like you take your dog or your cat in to get vaccinated for rabies, but I still never ever would touch any, any wild bat or any wild mammal with my bare hands. I always use leather gloves. Safety first. Now an average of one to two people per year have died from bat rabies in the United States since the 1950s. Here's just one example from this one random year, 1996. There were 42 people died from insect bites or stings, probably from bee sting allergies. Four people died from peanut butter allergies and one person died from bat rabies. So, so it's rare, but the risk is there. So um, we just always have to tell people safety first. Now in the United States, because we vaccinate our dogs and cats and the health departments mandate uh, dog vaccinations for sure from rabies, that's one of the great public health success stories in the United States is, is canine rabies vaccination programs. So domestic rabies has been pretty much almost eliminated in the United States because of those pet vaccination programs. So keep your, your dogs and cats current on their rabies vaccinations always. And if you have any questions, call your veterinarian. But that leaves wildlife as the primary vectors of or the animals most susceptible to rabies in the United States. And nationwide, raccoons are the number one rabies vector followed by bats, then skunks, then coyotes, and foxes. So safety first around any wild mammal. The problem with, with bats uh, that we're most concerned with is people are more cautious around say a raccoon or a bobcat or a coyote or one of the bigger mammals with bigger teeth, one of the bigger carnivores with bigger teeth, no one would ever try and rescue an injured raccoon with bare hands. But because our bats are so tiny, um, people sometimes are not as cautious around bats as they should be. So always, always, always safety first, never, never handle any wild mammal, especially any wild bat or any bat 
with your bare hands. Even if it's a tiny little baby canyon bat, never pick it up with your bare hands. So rabies is not transmitted by bat guano, bat feces or poop. It's not transmitted by blood or by urine. It's transferred in infectious materials such as saliva. So here I'm gonna reiterate, never handle bats or other wild mammals with bare hands. And keep your pets current on their rabies vaccinations. Okay, here's a couple more bat facts. Pound for pound, a lactating mother bat, a nursing mom, produces five times as much milk as a Holstein cow. Now remember, uh, say a, a woman just gave birth to a toddler, so that toddler is going to need a lot of milk, so they have to crank out a lot of milk, so they're going to eat a lot of bit, bugs so that they can produce all that milk to feed their pup. And the pups, they, the mothers can fly around with the pups for the first few days until the pup gets too big, and then the mom will have to park the pup in the nursery group while she goes out to hunt insects, and then they'll come back and forth and feed their pup during the night. So here in San Diego County, baby bat season is generally from May through September. So all the, the bat calls that we're getting right now, these are all full grown adult sized bats. Some of them were born earlier this summer, but pretty much all the babies are grown up and they're out on their own and, and have learned to fly and, and learn to hunt. And they may be starting to migrate through the area right now. So I think we're getting some, some calls about migratory problems are migrating bats right now, like if a bat is migrating through an area and, and is hanging over the wrong doorway or something. So baby bat season is May through September. So if you have an unwanted bat colony, like in your attic or somewhere where you, you need to humanely evict them, this is the time of year to do it because all the babies can be humanely evicted with their moms. Here's a few pictures of what we do as a, as a wildlife rehabilitator. And I'm so grateful to Project Wildlife and the San Diego Humane Society for, for supporting all of our efforts and for all their amazing vet staff down at the care center. It's just a wonderful group. So here's, here's some of the patients that they've helped us save. Now this photo, unfortunately, if we get in glue trap victims, we probably lose about half of them. Uh, this photo was a, I believe it was a little brown myotis. This glue trap was intended for rodents and somebody thought they had rodents in their attic. Well, it turned out that they weren't rodents, they were bats. They had a little bat colony and there was another dead bat trapped on the other side. You can't see the other one. So one, one bat got stuck, was probably echolocating or calling out and another bat came down to try and help and they both died in this one glue trap. So don't, don't use glue traps even for rodents, that would just be a terrible way for some, you know, sensitive mammal to die. Just, just don't use them where, where any animal like that could get stuck. We get in several bats every year that are trapped on flypaper, especially from barns or horse arenas, uh, venues like that. So if you have trouble with flies, you know, it just if and you need to use flypaper, just put up. Um, you can hang your flypaper in like a little tube of chicken wire, and that way you can still get the flies in there and, and work on your fly problem, but you're not going to accidentally catch swallows or bats because uh, it can really uh, grievously injure little, little bats or birds if they get stuck on a fly paper. Uh, we have one that was getting ready to release right now, actually, uh, from a fly paper victim. But she's okay, so she's going to go back to the wild soon. We get a lot of bats with broken wing bones. Their little wing bones are smaller than Q-tips. This is somebody's thumb, just to give you some scale. And so this was a fractured forearm right above the elbow. So that bat, I don't think this bat made it. We get quite a few nuisance calls sometimes. Sometimes all these folks need is just a little bit of education. Oftentimes, like I said, if, a, if bats are starting to migrate through an area or if the young bats have just learned to fly and learned to hunt and they're striking out on their own to chase insects, sometimes they'll, they'll roost in inappropriate places. When I was a young mammal, sometimes I hung out in inappropriate places. So young bats, apparently the teenage bats also don't always show the best judgment. So this was an apartment complex down in Mira Mesa. And this is the front door of the apartment. And here's a little door to their laundry area. And the people were afraid to walk from here to here because of that. So as it turned out, 
that was a, a juvenile Eumomyotis, and you can see how little he was from the texture of the stucco. And he would he didn't realize that he stuck out like his tore thumb against the color of the stucco. And uh, they don't want to fly away in the daytime because they're tiny. And any of the flying predators, any hawk or raven or crow or scrub jay or even mockingbirds will try and catch them and eat them if they see them out flying in the daytime. So we recommend that the folks just kind of monitor the, the juvenile and let us know if he was still there the next morning. And by the next morning, he had flown away. And um, usually we'll give them a stern lecture about making better life choices in the future. There was another nuisance call. This was also Mira Mesa. This is also a juvenile, Eumomyotis. Usually it's the males that are striking out on their own, getting in trouble, making bad choices. And they were afraid to come out and close up their barber shop because of, uh, of this little Eumomyotis. So we, he was humanely collected and then released nearby after dark when it was safe in a little more open area away from this uh, building. So we get in orphans. Thank goodness all of our orphans are full grown now because it was a long baby season this year. This is an orphan big brown bat pup. And you can see uh, this is somebody's index finger. So he's, his fur is just starting to come in and he's lapping a modified mammal milk formula from a tiny little one cc micro pipette. This is an orphan California myotis. This is a, a little guy that you're going to meet in a, in a little bit. Uh, it's one of the smallest bat species in the United States. And this is my thumb, just to give you some idea of scale. And when he came in, he weighed 1.3 grams, which is a little bit more than a dollar bill. Just a tiny little guy. And for some reason, we don't know what happened, but um, he, uh, his arms are stunted, so he, he can fly, but he gets tired really quickly and he can't maintain flight. So he can't hunt his own food in the wild anymore. This is an example of a metabolic bone disease from a big brown bat. This guy was found grounded and the rescuer knew that it was a mammal and knew that it could have rabies. So they were careful. She used leather gloves when she was handling him. He was found just as a tiny furless pup and she fed him cow's milk for a week. And cow's milk doesn't have enough nutrients and calcium and, and vital you know, nutrients that, that bat, baby bats need. Baby bats and baby birds, their wings grow really quickly because they have to be ready to either hibernate or migrate come fall. So they grow really fast. And just a week on cow's milk crippled this guy. His little finger bones never grew out all the way. And you can see how curved his knuckles are. So they were always a little inflamed and swollen. And he, he lived with us for about 10 years as an education ambassador. But this is one of the examples of why if you're not trained and uh, vaccinated and know what species of wild animal you're trying to care for, you should not be caring for those wild animals. You need to find a wildlife rehabilitator who can help raise that animal and knows exactly its nutritional requirements so that hopefully it can be raised up and released back to the wild where they belong. So this guy stayed with us, as I said, for about 10 years, and he educated thousands of people with us, but he was never able to get out there and be a wild bat. Here's an example of some orphan Mexican free tails, and they like to be swaddled. Uh, it makes them feel more secure, like they would be tucked under their mom's wing nursing. So um, these are little tiny foam tips. You know those little wands, the little eyeshadow applicator wands with the little foam on the end? These are the, the little foam tips that we pull off and, and dunk in modified milk formula, and then they suckle off of those. And you can see how little they are, and this is somebody's forefinger. And his little short forearms, his, bone, his arms haven't really even started to grow yet. You can just see a little velvet on his head. Oh, and when they come in like this, when they're furless, you, uh, it's easy to see when they're full because you can just flip them over and you can see through their skin and so you can see the milk line through their tummy. You get back to his broken arms. This is a Q-tip that was, um, the ends were sanded down a little bit and then it was used as a splint for this hoary bat. Here's one of those Mexican free tail pups all grown up and you can see the free tail kind of extending out past the tail membrane here. 
and it's learning to fly in a, in a mesh flight cage. Here's that spotted bat that I told you about, those cool spotted bats, they're really rare, with the big pink ears and the pale pink wings. Here's that hoary bat after she gave birth to the two twins. This guy's nursing down here. And here's one of the pups. You can see the tummy and its little finger bones. There's still cartilage, it's not even bone yet. And his little ball tummy. And here's the same bat all grown up. They're gorgeous bats. Bat burritos. Now these are Australian bats. They like to be swaddled. And after, after they're being fed, sometimes they don't want to give up their little binkies. Here's a way that you can help conserve our bats. This is a big free tail bat. She was a gorgeous bat found down near UTC and then released nearby after a few days. She got trapped in a tall building. Very rare species. Roost destruction. So I already mentioned about palm frond skirts. So these skirts are natural bat houses. So if you do have to trim them up just to reduce fire risk, you could always just trim part way and leave a few fronds up near the top to provide roosting habitat for owls or kestrels or bats. And then, as I mentioned, the bats do like to use old abandoned mines as, as hibernation sites or as maternity sites. And so a lot of land agencies, they'll do field surveys first to see if bats are using the mine. And then if they are afraid that humans are gonna get in there and get trouble or get lost or die, they can put up these steel bat gates so that bats can still get in and out to use the old mine as a safe site, but humans can't get in there and get injured. Inhumane attic exclusions are another big problem that we deal with sometimes. Uh, it's illegal to exclude bats during baby season. There is no humane way to exclude a bat colony in the middle of baby season because the babies can't fly. Look at these little short stubby fingers. These guys cannot fly away with their mothers. So we've had a few instances of people that didn't realize that, that you know, they didn't know any better and so they uh, maybe accidentally sealed the mothers out and left the pups behind or sometimes even sealing them into the attic or into the, into the roost with their pups. So that's, that's one of the big things that we try and educate people about. Wind turbines, a lot of people don't realize that, that bats are killed at these wind turbines. When the blade tips are spinning, it doesn't look like they're moving very fast, but at the tip, they can actually be moving about 200 miles an hour. And the bats, when they're migrating through these areas, they don't even have to get struck directly by the turbine blade. Just the pressure change is enough to rupture their eardrums or rupture their lungs. So it's important not to site these big wind turbine sites along migration corridors or near where big bat colonies live or roost. Some of you may have heard about white nose syndrome. It's a fungus that is believed to have been imported from Europe and it because our native bats in North America didn't have any previous immunity to this fungus, it, it eats through the skin of their wings when they're hibernating in the winter, and it's caused 90 to 100% mortality in some of these affected caves. There was a cave in, I believe this cave was in either Vermont or New York, and the, uh, it used to have like 30,000 bats hibernating in there every winter, and then they go in there in the spring and, and they don't find any bats or they'll only find like 10 bats left alive in the cave and the floors of the cave are just littered with these dead bats. It's, it's wiped out at least six or seven million bats in the northeastern U.S. in just the last 10 years. So it's, and because bats have such a slow reproductive rate, those bat colonies will, I'm sure, not recover in our lifetime. If they ever do recover to their previous numbers, like the little brown myotas back east, it will take hundreds and hundreds of years for those, for those populations to recover. Now COVID-19 is not found in United States bats. The, the virus SARS coronavirus 2 that, uh, that is causing this COVID-19 problem uh, is, has actually never been found in a bat. They believe that it may have evolved from a species of virus found in the, the family of horseshoe bats in Southeast Asia but the exact virus has never been found in any bat. So it, it may have originated in bat, you know, decades ago and have evolved into a form that can hurt humans, but it is not found in any of our US bats or North American bats. So the US um, 
wildlife agencies and California wildlife agencies are trying to protect bats, our bats from this disease. So all the orphans that we got into care this year, before we released them, we, uh, we actually sampled them and tested them for COVID-19, for coronavirus, and, uh, and they all tested negative, like this girl, this little eumomyotis, and we were able to release them back to the wild. They want to make sure that we do not inadvertently introduce this disease to our North American bats, especially after the problems that they found with white nose syndrome, because our bats had no immunity to that either, and it's just had such devastating consequences so they want to make sure that we also are trying to protect our, our native wildlife from this new virus. So water for wildlife is really important here uh, as our climate dries out and, and a lot of the water sources dry up. Bats are increasingly used swimming pools and, and water tanks as a water source. So we get in several swimming pool rescued bats every year. And whenever we do, I always recommend that that people might want to get a frog log or two. It's a little flotation device that anchors to the side of the pool and there's a little mesh ramp and it stays uh, anchors to the deck of the pool with a little bag that you fill with sand or pea gravel. And if you have a big pool, you might get two, one for each side of the pool. And that way animals up to a pound, if they get stuck in your pool, they'll dog paddle around the side of the pool until they get to the frog log and they can climb out and self rescue. So if you're, Using a water source like this, or if you have livestock tank or swimming pool and you uh, have a problem with critters getting in there, you can provide a safe drinking water source for uh, our local bats because their feet and their knees are on backwards than human feet and knees. So they have to be able to swoop across a water source. They can't perch on the edge. They have to be able to swoop across and with their little tongue hanging out to get a drink of water on the, on the wing. And so they have to have a clear swoop path across that water. Here's some of the ways that you can help bats. You can save their homes, save their habitat. They need creeks, lakes, and other natural habitat to hunt insects at night and safe places to sleep during the day. Don't litter or pollute and try not to use pesticides in your yard. Don't trim tall palm trees in the spring or summer. If you trim those palm fronds in the spring, you could be uh, cutting down nests with baby kestrels or owls or hooded orioles or, or other birds. Or if you trim in the summertime, you could be trimming out baby bats that can't fly away with their moms. You can keep your house cats indoors, especially at night, to protect bats and birds. Cats can't help it. They're just going to go hunt things because it's, you know, that's what they do. So, but they can really have a devastating effect on our local wildlife populations like lizard, horned toads, uh, bats, and birds, obviously. You can protect bats from sticky traps and glue traps. So like I said, if you use flypaper, just put it in a little cone of chicken wire or a little tube of chicken wire, and that way you'll catch the flies and you won't catch any accidental victims. You can provide safe water for bats with an open pond or a frog log in your swimming pool. You can help the San Diego Humane Society uh, by you know donating to them so that uh, they can keep us in mealworms because bats eat a lot of mealworms. We've gone through a lot of mealworms this past summer. I just got a new order in a couple of days ago. And you can, this is one of the best ways that, that students can help bats. They can learn more about bats and they can educate people about bats. Most people don't know anything about bats except what they saw in some nasty old vampire movie. So you can teach them how important bats are to ecosystems how many crop pests they eat, how many uh, important plants they pollinate or they disperse seeds for those plants. You can talk about how cool and gorgeous they are and how long they live and how slow they reproduce. You can, if you have to do a report on a wild animal, you could pick a really cool bat species to do a report on that and, and teach your classmates and your teachers and your family about spotted bats or pallid bats or Honduran white bats. So those are some of the ways that that you guys can help bats. You can also become a bat advocate. So uh, if there's any bat questions, you can uh, shoot them through to Carly and then I will get set up for, um, for the bat cam. All right, so we do have a few that came through, Cindy. So maybe you can answer while you're getting the bat cam set up. Um, first one was, what difference does it make if vampire bats lap up a teaspoon of blood um, 
of that would make the cattle rancher want to kill them? Well, because they could spread rabies. Most ranchers don't vaccinate their herds uh, for, against rabies. So it's, um, that's the main concern is that they can spread rabies through a cattle herd. Uh, how do you humanely evict bats? They're, they're nuisance wildlife control operators who are specially trained in doing humane bat evictions. And what they will do is um, they'll find out where the bats are getting in and out of the crevice. And then the, they can put up netting or little tube devices so that it acts as a one-way exit. And that way the bats can safely get out, uh, you know, weather dependent. And usually they'll leave up these exclusion devices for a week or two to make sure that every bat has flown out, you know, eventually and not been able to return. And so that they act as a one-way valve. So the bats can get out at dusk, but they're not able to climb back in at dawn. And then once you're sure that the whole colony has been able to fly away safely, then those, uh, those entry points are permanently sealed. Gotcha. And some, some people will also put up a bat house prior to do the exclusion. And that way they still have the bats in the area uh, hunting insect pests and helping, you know, with garden pests and mosquito control, and then um, giving them an, another spot for them to take up roosting. Exactly. Um, what are the natural predators of San Diego bats? Probably mostly the raptors, I would think. I know that Cooper's hawks will get them. Um, uh, Red-tailed hawks, I guess, but I know Cooper's hawks and other, other hawks will get them. Uh, ravens, crows, any of the, the corvids like that will take them. Do we vaccinate for rabies before they get released? That is our protocol, yes. And then someone said, Cindy is great. What is your background? <laughs> I'm, I don't have, I'm not a biologist. I wish I was. <laughs> uh, I'm just a bad enthusiast. I, I got interested in bats from a 1986 National Geographic article written by Dr. Merlin Tuttle, who founded Bat Conservation International. And uh, um, the photos of the flying foxes were, were what I, I was just in love. They look like puppies with wings. What was not to love about that? And the text of the article talked about how important they are and how underappreciated they are and so that, uh, I just became a big bat advocate after that. And um, so I'm a pretty well-educated lay person. I don't have a degree in, in anything, you know, <laughs> relevant, but I'm fairly, well, fairly knowledgeable for an for a amateur. You've done a lot of studying. We have another one that says, we live in Julian and have bat houses. Sometimes it seems like our bats leave in the winter. Do they leave the area or are they hibernating? And if they hibernate, would they be doing it inside their bat house? From what I'm told from the local biologist, it's usually the bat houses tend to be used as summertime maternity sites, not as hibernation sites. It, it might be too exposed for them. So during the winter, uh, they're probably moving out to a somewhere that is more stable temperature wise, uh, like maybe a rocky crevice or a cave or possibly into an old mine nearby. It's hard to tell. Bats are so little that it's only the bigger species could even have radio telemetry tags put on them for a little while to try and track them. Mo like the two species that you're seeing right here, this is Tracy over here on this side and she only weighs about you know, five to six grams, depending on how much she's been eating. And James over here, he only weighs about three and a half grams. So they're very tiny and they, it's really hard to track them. So there's, there's a lot of speculation about where our bats go in the winter time. So in Julian, they may be going down the mountains a little bit to a, somewhere, you know, lower in elevation to spend the winter. Yeah, it's really hard to tell. I have, I have one big brown bat that, that uh, it's a, a bachelor male who comes to my bat house and I'm in Fallbrook, but uh, I'm just his summer home apparently. Usually he shows up uh, around mid-May and then he leaves sometime after Labor Day and I don't really know where he goes for the winter. I'm just a summer joint. <laughs>
Uh, we have another one that says, given the numbers are in the tens of millions in one cave, are any species in danger? Many species are, uh, well, I think in the U.S. there are several species that are endangered. In Southern California, we only have one species that was formerly listed as federally endangered, the um, lesser long-nosed bat. But because of conservation efforts with that bat, it has been delisted. So now it's just considered threatened. But half of our 22 local bat species are declining in numbers and uh, more than half of them are considered California species of special concern. Gosh, yeah. Um, do they have hollow bo bones like birds? No, that's a great question. Bats have solid bones like all of us other mammals do, so they have to work harder to stay airborne. You know how um, birds can glide? Well, bats cannot glide because they have those solid bones, so, so they're always having to flap and that's how you can tell if you're out at dusk and you're not sure if it's a little sparrow that you're seeing flitting about. If it's flapping all the time and darting around erratically chasing insects, it's probably a bat, not a bird. Because birds can't, or bats can't glide. They have to flap all the time. And uh, the other thing about bats is some of our bat species, they have real long, narrow wings. And so they have to, it's harder for them to get airborne. So most of our bats, it's easier for them to take off because of those solid bones if they have some drop space beneath them. They, some, most of them can take off from the ground if they have to, but it's harder for them. And um, this is my own adding to it that I've heard you say before. Um, they have to kind of warm their muscles up before they air build, they're able to fly. So that's why they can get trimmed out of the tree so easily and that they can't just fly out when they hear the trimmers coming. Right, right. Yeah, when uh, bats can go into a, some of them are true hibernators, but all of them can go into a daily torpor, which is a state of mild hibernation, and they lower their heart rate and their respiration rate and their body temperature. But in order to gain, uh, to warm up their muscles and fly away, they have to shiver. So if it's cold and the bat is in torpor or is even hibernating, sometimes they'll have to shiver and warm their muscles for up to a half an hour before they would be able to fly away. So it depends on where you are and how cold the temperature is and what species. But uh, generally, yeah, especially if it's cooler, sometimes we've gotten calls from people who found like a hoary bat that got blown out of its tree during a winter storm and they find it on the ground in the backyard and, and they think, oh, this poor thing, it's so lethargic, it's near death. But it was just a hoary bat in torpor. And so, uh, you never know it, until you warm the bat up. Oh, look, Tracy's gonna go get a midnight snack. Uh, Tracy. Tracy is a Yuma myotis, and this, uh, as I said, is one of our more common species, and usually they'll hunt emerging aquatic insects like mosquitoes. And this girl was lucky. She was happened to be living in a maternity site. She was born early in spring one year, uh, back in 2017, and some biologists were doing a survey of her maternity site and happened to see all the other juveniles out learning to fly and and fluttering around in the floor of this uh, cave. And this one little bat was, was unable to stay airborne. She was only able to flutter a couple of feet off the ground. Oh, Tracy. And they, they captured her. They were both vaccinated for rabies and they captured her and did a quick field exam. And they could see that her finger bones didn't grow out all the way. So we don't know what happened, but she developed metabolic bone disease. And we weren't able, if she was already too big, we weren't able to reverse it. So her finger bones never grew out all the way. So that's why she stayed with us now. And she, you can see she loves her mealworms. She's hungry. Um, we have one more person that they asked if you can show the five bats of happiness coin again. Oh, sure. We didn't get quite a good look because the screen was a little small, but now I think oh. you can show it a little closer. Okay, hold on, let me hold it to the right cam. Oops, right, that's, it looks backwards on here though. There you, yeah. There you go. So there's those are five bats on there. The five, the woofoo, the five bats of happiness. Perfect. There she goes. Oh, now she's gonna go hang out with James. And you can see the color, the different fur color. Usually Yuma's, Yuma myotis tend to be more of a, a soft gray color. 
But Tracy is really pretty blonde for a Yemomyotis, and you can clearly see her, full, her fur coloration is different than the California Myotis. Uh, James is definitely a darker brown. And Tracy's thinking about going to get another snack. So let me get Kelly out. Kelly's our big brown bat. And uh, let's see if Tracy's going to go get another snack. Let me get Kelly. Now, obviously, all of these bats, if they could survive in the wild, we would have released them back in the wild. That's, that's always the goal with any, with any of our wild patients. And we get in more than 12,000, 10 to 12,000 wild patients a year. So we don't, we don't want to keep animals in captivity. We want them out in the wild, you know, making baby bats and eating bugs to help us. But if we get an animal that would not be able to survive in the wild, then we can evaluate them and, and our vets examine them and see if they would be suitable as an education ambassador. So, so that's... And everyone, we have a lot of quite a strict permitting process that we have to go through in order to keep them as education ambassadors. So just so everyone knows, we are a highly regulated and permitted organization. Um, and that's what allows us and Cindy to keep these animals. And the only reason we're allowed to keep them is if they provide education for their, um, for the community members and for their cousins in the wild. So it's a very strict process in order for an animal to become an ambassador. Um, so it's definitely something like Cindy had mentioned earlier, as soon as you find an injured animal, please get them into a licensed rehabilitator as soon as possible so that that person can go ahead and uh, go ahead and start uh, rehabilitating. Um, Cindy, I think we just, oh, your camera, we just switched cameras. <laughs> there we yeah, go. Wrong, bu wrong button, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> I know, I was like, oh my gosh, we lost everybody, but no, we're still on, we're good. <laughs> That's oh. Kelly. Kelly's a big brown bat. She was found uh, in somebody's yard, somebody's backyard on a cold morning. And she must have either fallen or, or gotten knocked out of a roost somehow. And uh, because she was cold, apparently she couldn't open her wings and break her fall. She pretty badly injured both of her wrists. And her, uh, her left wrist healed up pretty well, but her right wrist it never um, healed up all the way, and so she's not able to extend that wing all the way. So folks, this is going to be the chance to get your final questions in before we say goodbye. Um, if anyone has any last or final sayings that we have to say. Oh, one thing um, Cindy Maria did put in there that it is Tregai for a plural oh. of tragus. <laughs> oh, thank you for looking that up. <laughs> Tragi, okay. And just to confirm, the Western Mastiff is the bat that echo locates in the lower frequency that humans can hear. Yes, the Western Mastiff bats do that. There's also a, a slightly smaller free-tailed bat species called the big free-tailed bat, and they also echolocate at a frequency low enough for humans. And I'm told the spotted bats also echolocate low enough for human ears to hear. But all the other species, it's, it's way too high for our ears. Perfect. Yep. And just a reminder, we are recording this lecture. And we it takes us a little time to get it uploaded to the site. But we will be getting that up um, hopefully by next week. Um, but if, not, if it's not on the SDHS or sdhumane.org website next week, it will be the following week. So please feel free to share this with any of your family or friends. We always encourage people to learn more about our lovely bat species and how important they are to our healthy ecosystems. And here in San Diego, we are just super happy that we have so many different species. And we are very lucky to have a wonderful bat team. Um, they're small but mighty, and they do such a great job at rehabilitating our local bat species. Um, here in San Diego, we're super lucky that we have the ability to rehabilitate bats. It's not a very common area, a very common thing that a lot of states even allow for rehabilitators to do. So we are super special here in San Diego. 
But yes, thank you everyone. Bats are extremely wonderful. And I don't know how you can't love bats after listening to Cindy's presentations. And I learn something every single time I, <laughs> I join in one of her programs. But we'll hold off and let us see if uh, Miss Kelly still wants to eat. Um, but this is going to conclude our presentation, everyone. Again, we will be posting this webinar to the website. Again, it is furball today, which normally we'd be having about 300 of our closest friends and their pets dressed up to the nines coming into our shelter and helping raise funds for the nearly 50,000 animals that San Diego Humane Society takes in every year and helps. Um, the link is in the beginning of that chat. Um, check it out. There are a few auction items and uh, one of them is going on a wildlife release and another one is being a wildlife rehabilitator for a day. So if you've ever been interested in doing either of those, um, check out that site and uh, put a bid in. But there are some really amazing auction items up. But um, today, if we are able to raise up to $225,000, we have some amazing donors that are going to match that for us. So take a look at that site. Um, but everyone, everyone, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Again, any last final questions, put them on up, but I think we're good. Thank you, Cindy. Carly. Cindy, as always, you did an amazing job. Thank you so much. I, uh, I hope everyone enjoyed learning all about bats today and meeting a few of our education ambassadors. Stay well, everyone. Hopefully at some point in time, we can get back to having these uh, speaking engagements in person again, but until then, Take care, stay safe, and be well, everyone. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you.